Uh, Neil Basu, Deputy Assistant Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police, and Gavin Stevens, Deputy Chief Constable of Surrey Constabulary, are going to do a short presentation each. I'm told it's going to be short. Um, and then we're going to take questions uh, from you guys here. We're going to take questions via the app. And I've got a few myself as well. So please welcome first Neil Basu. Thank you. I'm so sorry this is unlikely to be as short as you might be anticipating. Can you hear me all right at the back? Yeah, I can see lots of nods. Thank you. And a thumbs up. Um, I asked that question a few years ago when I was head of armed policing in London to a heavily armed audience pre-shift. Uh, and I was met by the response, I can hear you perfectly well, Governor, but I'm willing to change places with someone who can't. Um, they were really heavily armed, so I just took that heckle in the spirit that it was given. Um, thank you, Gavin, for inviting me to speak. All of policing has found itself overworked and underappreciated, in my view, probably for about the last decade. In my experience, that statement really applies to members of this association. You're our key leaders, deliverers and motivators. It's a pleasure to be able to stand here uh, and say firstly a simple thank you for everything it is that you do and continue to do for us. I was very proud of my time in this association and in those ranks. Uh, I really mean that and quite often the Superintendent's Association has been the voice of reason amongst the various policing bodies. Uh, I am a DAC employed by the Met, in fact 25 years in the Met, um, but I'm also the Senior National Coordinator for CT Policing, so what does that mean? Um, AXO, Assistant Commissioner of Specialist Operations, is Mark Rowley, he's the Head of UK Counterterrorism. Uh, he's employed by the Commissioner, he's appointed by Chief's Council to be the Portfolio Lead for Terrorism and Other Allied Matters. So I'm one of his two deputies. The other is DAC Lucy Dorsey. And together we deliver CT Policing's contribution to the government's counter-terrorism strategy, which you'll know is called CONTEST. And there are four pillars to CONTEST, colloquially referred to as the four Ps. I'm responsible for coordinating the pursuing, trying to catch terrorists, and the prevent activity, and Lucy is responsible for protect and prepare across the UK. For this, I was given the title Preparing for Terrorism, so I want to take you through a short history and evolution of CT policing in the UK, what that's actually meant for our current structure, the threat as it is today and how it's developed since 2011, perhaps a brief description of contests, what I think our greatest challenges are today in terrorism and what we might have to do differently in the future uh, given the horrors we've faced this year. So. This tells you a little bit about our history from left to right, where we, you look at CT policing, which has evolved over many, many decades. So its roots were in Northern Ireland Republican terrorism and Irish independence. It was back in 1883, the Fenians uh, had a series of bomb attacks in London, and that led to the first 12 counter-terrorism officers being recruited and answering directly to the Home Secretary of the day. That was it. Uh, we're in the many thousands today. After each event, we learn we had decades to work alongside MI5 during the Troubles, but I'm not sure we would have described it as a real partnership then. The Good Friday Peace Agreement left MI5 and CT policing questioning their role and scale, but 9-11 was the obvious game changer, and then the War on Terror and the effect that had on Western security both here and overseas. And that was the start of what we now call international CT threat, a threat from radical extreme Islamist terrorism. But that still seemed very far away. And structurally, in the UK, it was still London's Met leading on counter-terrorism. The epicentre was the capital, where the greatest threat and risk was seen to be, and to some extent that is still true. It carries about 55 to 60% of all the operational risk and about 80% of all the iconic sites. But the overseas focus and the London focus did have to change. In 2002, we had the Ricin plot originating in Wood Green. Uh, that was a realisation that terrorists weren't just in Belfast or the Middle East, they were here at home. And not just in London, but operating all over the UK. In 2004, the crevice plot involved five terrorists manufacturing a 600 kilogram bomb. And they were using Thames Valley, Sussex, Surrey and Bedfordshire as their base. We realised we needed a network of CT police and MI5 covering the whole of the UK. And Chief Constables and MI5 started to develop the CT network that we have today. In 2005, 7 7 and the failed plot of 21 7 accelerated the development of that regional network, where MI5 and police are now co located to drive operations to disrupt the threat. And if the fight against Northern Ireland Republican terrorism was contest version one, this new fight needed a new operating model, and this network was and is contest two. And until May 2013 and Lee Rigby's horrific murder outside Woolwich Barracks, it had served us very well. <laughs> 
In fact, over the next four years, there were no successful attacks and 13 disrupted plots. Whilst others in Canada, USA, Australia, France, Belgium, I could go on, have all suffered. And even with the attack on tourists in Seuss, the public may have been forgiven for thinking that terrorism was not actually here in the UK, it was a hypothetical threat to us. Well, didn't that change this year? This next slide shows you what the, uh, the network we created was uh, and is to deal with the threat in your community. So 43 Home Office Forces divided into nine regions, five counter-terrorism units and four counter-terrorism intelligence units. The difference between the first has investigative capacity uh, and the second, um, because the threat is less, relies on buddy forces to assist them. Regional chief constables appoint lead chief officers, usually ACCs, and a senior detective to run CT and domestic extremism investigations in their region and have to resource and equip them from the CT grant. We're also supported by Police Scotland, the PSNI, uh, and chief constables also fund from their core budgets, and more of that in a minute, their local special branches, which provide additional CT capability and capacity. Now, every large-scale incident or proactive operation requires assistance across that whole network. And we can mobilise that entire network from the centre uh, to assist any one of you in dealing with a threat on your local turf. At their height, those four attacks that Cathy mentioned absorbed 715 counter-terrorism detectives, all working simultaneously. There is no force, even London, that could cope on its own. And the initial response, the first few hours, the first few days, the initial week, is absolutely core policing. In fact, in those early hours and up to that first week, the resource that's actually dealing with that post-incident is 50 to 70% core policing alongside emergency service partners. So that tells you that policing is a machine with many moving parts. It tells you that CT policing is a small fraction of that effort required to keep us safe. And that's why we can't afford for the further cuts in wider policing, even if we remain the, uh, safe with the CT grant. This is a horrible slide that shows you governance. This is massively simplified. Governance in counter-terrorism is incredibly complicated. Chief constables invest faith in EXO um, to lead the CT model through the, his counter-terrorism coordinating committee. They all signed a Section 22A agreement in 2016, surprisingly late, actually formalising that agreement. They retain accountability and responsibility in their force areas, so, although, um, so what that makes this is a collaborative model. It's not an old-fashioned command and control model, and that makes it a very difficult leadership role for EXO and his senior team. But part of that Section 22 agreement is investing the responsibility in me to declare whether an incident is a terror attack or not, and if it's of national significance, uh, I'm required to take command and control at that point. AXO then has to report to a ministerial oversight group in Whitehall, that's chaired by the Security Minister, and of course he answers to the Met's Commissioner as part of her board. But after Chief Constables, our key partner is MI5. That is the single agency uh, with the prime lead on domestic national security. But CT policing over those decades now shares strategy, priorities, threat assessments, information handling and assessment processes with five. We assess and decide on leads together. We decide on investigative strategy together. We task and coordinate assets together. We tie into HMG at the highest levels together. And together we jointly brief the Home Secretary, Security Minister and Prime Minister. And it's that close connection between the intelligence community, policing and government that has made the UK CT policing model widely admired throughout the world. That simply doesn't exist in many places for historic, legal, constitutional and sometimes simply distrustful reasons. The lack of join up creates gaps and gaps are what terrorists need to be successful. So I had slides demonstrating the volume of threats, but um, this slide basically illustrates the way that targets and methods have changed over time, showing some real life examples. I'd normally go through them, I'm not gonna do that. Um, but it does demonstrate the futility of trying to predict the who, the what, the when, and the where. The UK threat level, you'll all be aware, is severe. That means an attack is highly likely. There was one disrupted just 10 days ago outside Buckingham Palace. And for four days post-Manchester, it's the first time we've actually gone to critical, meaning an attack was imminent, when we couldn't be sure that we weren't facing um, a, a wider network. So a short history lesson on how we got to that current threat level way back in 2014. And I don't think it's going to change, and certainly not before I retire. But in 2011, you had a few AQ complex plots against mostly soft civilian targets, and that included aviation. 
And in that year, you also had the Arab Spring, the fall of a number of dictators. That power vacuum let terrorist groups thrive. AQ is ruthlessly targeted by the US and with the help of other Western governments. And from that disruption came the so-called Islamic State. And the speed of their ascent was not anticipated by anybody. In 2014, they march on Mosul and Raqqa. Their leader, Baghdadi, declares a caliphate. He seizes territory and assets and organizes. They form a base to project that threat. Baghdadi and his external spokesman, uh, a man called Alad Nani, who's now deceased, made masterful speeches. They began to use advanced war propaganda and compelling social media. They really know how to use Twitter if you don't, to attract followers to the cause. And eventually, 30 to 40,000 foreign fighters uh, leave countries in order to assist. Their families follow, and a quasi state starts to function. Now, intelligence that they wanted to expand that terror threat overseas and into the UK increased our threat level to severe in October 2014. In 2015, IS drive to increase external operations and project that threat across the rest of the world, partly in revenge for attacks on IS uh, in Iraq and Syria. The threat becomes more diverse, not just directing and enabling terror attacks um, from their Middle East base, but inspiring and encouraging attacks, and therefore the volume starts to increase dramatically. The IS machine is dominated by Francophiles, so France and Belgium are natural targets. They want to attack where they know best. The speeches are aimed at the police, military and state agents, and so they become the natural first targets. In late 2015, that horrific November 13th Paris attack, 2016 and now 2017, the targeting has changed to soft civilian targets, iconic sites and crowded places. And the complexity and the methodology has changed over time too. So now it's the simplest methods being advocated by IS propaganda. Low sophistication, low tech, low cost. Bladed weapons and hired vehicles. Nice, Berlin, Stockholm, Westminster, London Bridge. Also now copied by the, uh, the extreme right wing at Finsbury Park. The targets are softer, crowded places with poor defense, major events, women and children. Lone actors are becoming more prominent. The vulnerable and malleable too, with a preponderance of mental health issues in the lone actor space. And increasingly, the terrorists are getting younger, mid-teens, and also disturbingly, our first disrupted female cohort of terrorists this year. There's no need to travel to the caliphate. You can do it right here. You don't need permission from an emir in Syria, and you no longer need to worry about the covenant of security that says you must not attack where you live. There is less need to communicate as you don't need support and facilitation, for example, money, accommodation, forged documents, if it's just a simple plot. The big, organized, complicated plotting is still there, but it's rare. So the threat was the traveler or the returning fighter who was battle-hardened and even angrier. But now it's the threat in our midst. We stopped a lot of those would-be jihadists traveling too, and some of those remain committed to their cause. If they can't travel, then why not attack us here? There is also a definite problem in segregated and isolated communi communities and with what I think is an even more extreme second generation. That generation feels disenfranchised. Um, they're watching the wars abroad. They're personalizing the attacks on their religion and community. They blame the government policy and agents of the state who don't understand their religion properly and perhaps don't see a future for themselves in the West. And they're, getting, they're used to getting all of that information in, an, on average, six-second sound bites through their handheld devices 24-7. That is a very toxic combination. And they absolutely believe they are justified. And they absolutely want to destroy the Western way of life. And they absolutely do want to kill us. How do we change their minds? What does a sensible counter-extremism and community cohesion program look like? What role should police play in any of that? We've rightly described ourselves as a country with the most formidable CT apparatus in the world. No one joins up its security services, police and government like we do. No one has a comprehensive common government strategy like Contest. So what happened? We did predict that as IS was defeated on the battlefield, the threat would increase at home. But returning fighters, as I said, were our number one concern, but the threat was already here. And now it's not a spike, it's a shift in volume and threat. And that's what feels like a new norm. And that new norm is people unafraid to act, inspired by the success of others, able to use simple methods to maximum effect, no longer needing to travel to join a caliphate that's being destroyed, 
but prepared to act here at home. And they don't need to be directed, enabled anymore. They're self-starters. They can stand up and attack very quickly, and it can be very hard, if not impossible, to spot using our current methods and resources. And please don't even attempt to profile the terrorists. They have been middle-aged. They have been very young. They have been men, women, boys, girls, violent criminals, and people with no previous trace, police or CT. They've been the educated, they've been the illiterate, and they have been the completely unknown. This is what operational tempo looks like graphically demonstrated over this last summer. It had been growing steadily since 2014. Arrests and convictions were up year on year. And from May 2013 to March 2017, uh, over that four-year period, zero successful attacks, 13 disrupted plots. And yet from March 2017 to June 2017, just 16 weeks, four attacks, 36 dead, over 200 injured, and five disrupted plots. Truly a summer like no other. Truly a shift, not a spike in threat, and truly a new norm. And in volume terms, that has led us to leads are up threefold. And every week we open more than we close. Over 60 new investigations, so we used to talk about over 500. We we're a lot closer to 600. Arrests increasing by 75% since the first quarter of this year. A massive spike in the use of the anti-terrorist hotline by the public. An average of 200 calls a month reached 3,000 at its peak. So that public anxiety Cathy talked about is really being reflected and you'll be seeing the, uh, the influence in core policing. And to a point where we couldn't actually service those calls and our prevent referrals were up 34% in that first, compared to that first quarter. So, this is a quick list of our strategic challenges. The pressing challenge is the volume of leads and the pace of attack planning, coupled with, you'll have heard the expression, going dark. Uh, going dark is effectively uh, the use of encryption, and we can't see how terrorists are communicating. And that's leading us or pushing us more to early arrests. That kind of hit and hope strategy, hoping that we'll find the evidence once we get our physical hands on it as we go through the door. And that is not a successful long-term strategy. So I've had to run down that list really quickly. I don't prioritize these, but these are my views. Segregated, isolated communi communities, unregulated education and homeschooling are a breeding ground for extremism and future terrorism. The internet, social media, propaganda, and instruction. It's easy to get uh, instructions on building a bomb in your kitchen or how to attack someone with a knife, beamed live into your hands day and night from the other side of the world. Digital volumes, when we investigate people, we seize tetrabytes of information, and we have to go through all of that. That has to be triaged, an average of 10 tetrabytes per investigation. If anyone knows what a tetrabyte is, um, I can graphically demonstrate it, or I could do if I printed out one tetrabyte, and you'd have three and a half miles of A4 pieces of paper. So all of that has to be researched. Going dark, I've talked about digital degradation, uh, as it's poshly termed. Prisons and radicalization in prisons, the fact that our borders and ports are porous, there is a lack of biometrics, there is a lack of advanced passenger information. Um, the, the common travel area, roll on, roll off ferries, the insider threat, incoming flights from vulnerable countries. And our borders are not badly controlled. They are not badly controlled, but nevertheless, they are still vulnerable. The ready availability of weapons and precursors, the increasing number of firearms on our streets, which you'll be seeing in other aspects of crime. Returning foreign fighters I've discussed, which hasn't been uh, as huge an issue as we first thought, but there are still plenty there to come back. And then safeguarding or, or threat, so the pressures of the women and children who are returning from the battlefield, and whether we should be treating those as a safeguarding issue or a threat until we know better. Last slide, I promise, but this is contest. So this is what I call contest version two. This is the current strategy. It, What's happened this year begs the question, how do we combat the threat? Um, is the government strategy fit for purpose? Do we need to change it and create a step change to contest version three? My view is contest is broadly fit for purpose, and that is my view, but it is about to be subject to a very deep government review. If it does that, we must keep the four pillars, all of them. Uh, only the police actually routinely deliver across all four pillars, and that's a fact that should make us proud. And it's always pursue that dominates the conversation, uh, and normally about 80% of the budget. With 3,000 open uh, subjects of interest and 20,000 previous subjects of interest or suspects that we've looked at, 
uh, those numbers, they're just going to keep increasing. The volumes are large and we can't monitor everyone. It's a democracy and there are limits of proportionality and necessity. But we must create systems which are better at identifying the real threats. We also want tougher sentencing. We'll undoubtedly need more surveillance and cleverer covert techniques. We'll need more investigators, analysts, and clever digital forensic scientists. We need stronger borders and good biometrics. With the NCA, we need better control of commodities like guns, cash, and traffickers, and close partnership with prisons and a much stronger CHIS stable. But it's so obvious that we can't arrest our way out of this, or any other policing problem I can ever remember. It just becomes a revolving door, and this is a criminal cadre whose minds are hard, if not impossible, to change. So pursue must be relentless, but it's not enough, and many of the techniques that can radicalise the threat as much as they actually mitigate it. So protect. Protect has to be based on the efforts of our national risk assumptions. We must take care not to overreact. It could be easy but expensive to be so intrusive in protecting VIPs, critical national infrastructure and crowded places that we completely change our way of life. And we lose the balance of security over privacy and security over prosperity. What we must do is identify our vulnerabilities and be better at harnessing the power of the private sector and general public to help alongside our intelligent and proportionate protective security patrols. In PREPARE, our investment in PREPARE through JESSIP Command and Control Doctrine, our constant exercise and testing really paid dividends this summer. There is absolutely no doubt about it, but there are still gaps in some forces and there are not enough regional protect and prepare assets to help you drive that improvement. We've done a lot of, to improve our armed capacity and we've put it in the right places in my view, but we have to revisit our assumptions on whether that in itself is enough. Manchester proved how effective our military assistance could be, both conventional and special forces. And our public messaging and counter-terrorism campaigns are now being nominated for awards in the depth and breadth of their reach to inform the public uh, and try to increase their involvement. But it's prevent. To have any chance of reversing this generational challenge, for me, prevent is the most important pillar. And this is the one most criticised and the one most under threat. Our aim must be to prevent people being criminalised and going down the terrorist path through early intervention. The language must change to be one of safeguarding and we need to rebalance the police input towards partners whose skills are best placed to deliver exactly that. We need to help the vulnerable whilst encouraging communities to speak out against violence and deny hate preachers platforms to operate. We need to continue to target hate on the internet but we must put pressure on companies controlling those platforms to self-censor. Most importantly, we need public, local authority, health and education confidence to support the use of PREVENT to change hearts and minds. There was a 2015 legal duty, a statutory duty, and that was a start. But it can't be coercive. You really have to believe in this stuff if it's going to work. So if I was going to conclude, everything I've just said is fine, but they're actually small steps. They're a sort of continuous improvement of contest. And if a step change that's required, what, it, what exactly is that? What is CT version 3? Our key question is how we organise to deliver those four Ps for HMG. And we will need closer integration with MI5. We'll need closer cooperation with the NCA and ROCUs. We'll fight to maintain the network we have, directed nationally by EXO, organised regionally, delivering locally, and yet capable of reaching out internationally. Crucially, we'll fight to retain the support of communities through wider policing and partners. But I'll leave you with the three big changes I think are required. And the first is data collection. We need a single data store of UK intelligence community, policing and wider partners that's capable of being mined using intelligent questions based on what we know about the behaviour of terrorists. That's essential to discover the previously unknown threat in our midst. It's essential to mitigate a continuing threat and it's essential to spot an old threat that's becoming uh, or emerging once again. And only such an intelligent machine can deal with the volumes I've talked about. If you want to find a needle in a haystack, you might want to try get rid of some of the straw in the first place. And that's what a machine like that has to do. But with that will be huge privacy concerns to that approach. The second thing we'll need to do is data share. We all know it in every aspect of our policing that we can't do it alone. So daring to share by breaking out secret information to wider policing and partners, asking them to collect intelligence, monitor the threat, or even disrupt it, 
making sure that those that can be saved by Prevent are saved, and using some of those excellent multi-agency forums that have become routine in other areas of policing are absolutely essential in assisting CT policing and MI5 to manage and reduce the threat. We effectively need integrated offender management and prevent for terrorism. And lastly, getting the general public and private sector more involved in their own security. Two aspects there, protect. Uh, a really telling statistic, there are 10 police officers that patrol Oxford Street. There are 1,000 private security guards. Think of the amplification in protect. And the second is prevent. So a joined up counter extremism and community cohesion strategy by government led by the community. But with all of those three steps I've described comes a very significant ask of wider policing and partners, with all the resourcing and prioritisation that implies. And you'll hear many other things in this conference which will demand your time, effort, money and resource. The last effort, getting the public more involved, absolutely relies on their trust and confidence in policing, and that isn't one by CT police officers and MI5. It's one by the daily interaction of excellent policing in local communities. We need that. We need to keep that consent for what we have to do to keep us safe. It is a truism and a cliche, but it is true that we cannot arrest our way out of this. It's also true that only communities will defeat terrorism, and that will always require excellent community policing. Thank you for listening, and uh, enjoy the rest of your conference. And on that point on community policing, I'd like to hand over to Gavin. Thank you, Neil. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Neil's finishing point around communities defeating terrorism is my start point, really. And some of you may recognise this slide here. Back from 2005, this was. Uh, the officer on patrol on his bike there in a local neighbourhood is Jason. So this was at the peak um, of the National Reassurance Policing Programme, the beginning of the National Neighbourhood Policing Programme, a rosy time for us in terms of resourcing, when all looked good in terms of neighbourhood policing investment. Um, there was a big evaluation around uh, the National Reassurance Policing Programme. It's still worth a read today because it reminds us of some of the things that are important if we're going to win community support in dealing with the very real and difficult threats that Neil has described. It specifically talked about two key diagnostics there. Firstly, that if we want communities to help us, we have to understand the problems that they're facing. And secondly, we need to do something about them and be seen to do something about them. So the simple message from this significant piece of research back in 2005 was that if we want community support, we have to support communities. And there was a lesson from Jason and colleagues that said, we should never assume that their priorities are the same as our priorities, because often they are quite different. So if we want a dialogue, if we want community intelligence uh, coming forward on some of these very difficult issues, we must first take an interest in their issues. So you can see neighbourhood policing becomes something that's not discretionary. It's not something that can be taken away and the rest of the system thrives. It's an interconnected system. And national security is very much dependent on neighbourhood security because the, the attacks that Neil has described, where those attacks were, were thought up, were planned, we're in somebody's neighbourhood somewhere. And now, it's not just the UK model that sort of values this relationship of trust and legitimacy between communities. And before uh, President Obama left office, he commissioned a, a review on 21st century policing. Uh, and pillar one of that review uh, talked about building trust and legitimacy. So it's not just in the UK that we see the importance of this. And I just wanted to read you a very brief paragraph from, from that report um, from Obama's review. And it goes as such, building trust and nurturing legitimacy on both sides of the police-citizen divide is the foundational principle underlying the nature of relations between law enforcement agencies and the communities they serve. Decades of research and practice support the premise that people are more likely to obey the law when they believe that those enforcing it have the authorities perceived as legitimate by those subject to the, to the authority. Public confers legitimacy only on those who they believe are acting in just ways. In addition, law enforcement cannot build community trust 
if it is seen as an occupying force coming in from outside to impose control on the community. So pillar one of the report seeks to provide focused recommendation on building this relationship and it talks about law enforcement culture should embrace a guardianship role. But of course many of our communities don't see us in that way, they see this divide. Neil talked about segregated and isolated communities, there were reports post uh, riots in the 90s where it talked about communities building parallel lives uh, and this is somewhere that neighbourhood policing can really contribute. I was also struck last year and had a conversation with Mark Rowley about it post Brussels attacks um, where offenders had gone to ground, they'd hidden amongst the community for a number of days before finally being apprehended and if any of you saw some of the media vox pops on the street from people who lived in those neighbourhoods um, where uh, media colleagues, journalists were asking them, so you know, why didn't you come forward with information about this? They said, well, the police aren't interested in the things that affect us day to day, so why should we help them? And I found that quite shocking. You know, that's just on our doorstep, isn't it? That relationships had broken down to such an extent um, that they weren't willing to support police. So we know the importance of neighbourhood policing for tackling these very real threats, but of course there's a big challenge, isn't there? Um, you know, Gavin spoke this morning about the, the perfect storm on policing, the difficulty with police numbers. Well, this very simple chart says it all. So um, at the end of the National Reassurance Policing Programme in 2003, we got a commitment from the government of the day that they wanted it to be a legacy of that government uh, to invest in each and every neighbourhood across the land. Uh, I remember the debate at the time was to whether we were going to get investment for 21,000 police community support officers or 16,000 police community support officers. We got 16,000. And you can see that the peak that was reached there around 2008. I guess if I've got one regret is at the same time in about 2005 we were talking to colleagues in the security service about what neighbourhood policing could offer in terms of an integrated model, this in interconnected system. That conversation never really progressed as far as I would have liked it to, looking back in hindsight. Of course, there was big investment, as Neil described, in the CT network, but perhaps we should have cemented at that stage a real partnership between the neighbourhood officers right through to those that were investigating the most serious threats. Of course, what's happened in recent times, you can see that erosion. We're heading down towards fewer than 10,000 police community support officers now, and you will know in the areas that you're leading that PCSOs often now are the remaining part of neighbourhood policing. Uh, often there may be one or two constables um, and you can see the constable line at the top, the decrease in numbers that are holding the fort. And of course this has led uh, Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary to comment on the erosion of neighbourhood policing nationally and some of you may have seen the research from the Police Foundation that have talked about how models have progressed and there's been disinvestment in neighbourhood policing. At the same time as that reduction in numbers, of course, there's a real need for us to modernise the way neighbourhood policing is provided. Um, that's on prevent. What's the neighbourhood policing contribution to prevent? But also on threats like serious and organised crime, uh, child sexual exploitation, missing children, uh, cyber threats to our local communities. What's that about? Well, it's all about vulnerability, really, isn't it? Uh, Neil spoke about seeing prevent as protecting the vulnerable. And of course that protection of the vulnerable is done through online engagement now as well. So how strong is our voice, how strong is the local police in voice in giving a, a counter narrative to uh, uh, some of the messages that the, that the vulnerable hear. Um, there's lots of innovation in this area too. Some of you may have come across Professor Martin Innes' work at uh, University Police Sciences Institute in Cardiff. Um, whereas Neil has described mining a massive amount of publicly available data to help us get a, a much greater insight into the threat. Um, because the, those that want to bring death and destruction to our communities will use these networks as well. So we very much need to be um, uh, proficient in our use of them. So I guess the question for us as leaders is uh, how much do we support our teams in doing that? I know over recent years you'll have uh, invested much of your time and energy in improving our approach to vulnerability in specialist units. But at the same time, how much have we thought about the skills that a neighbourhood police officer, a police community support officer might need to make them confident in social media, to make them confident in spotting the, the signs of extremism and radicalisation and it, being confident and able to intervene early? How much do we really encourage our staff to get out there online within their communities and have a legitimate voice? 
Um, now, there are many pockets of good practice around the country like that, but it needs to become much more systematic if we're going to be successful. Neil also talked about data sharing. I'm sure many of you will have been through problem solving exercises in your local command units with partners where you have exercises that look like this. Data sharing, getting down to post-it notes on a wall. This is a, an example from the Troubled Families program led by DCC uh, Simon Nicholas up in Cleveland. Um, and this is partnership interventions against one single family. Very complex needs. Neil talked about communities feeling isolated, maybe unregulated education, an absence of education, leading to great disruption within the family and within the local community. Now, I won't explore this in detail in the interest of time, but what the examples from the Troubled Families Programme showed is that where we do integrate, we can solve problems like this very well. Uh, so this particular family uh, that was subject to the interest from just about every agency you can imagine, but in an uncoordinated way, was able to be turned around with the right support and the right plan across different partners. Uh, so when Neil talked about the join up with local authority provision, making sure we get the right specialist provision for what are sometimes very complex needs, it can be done. But of course it takes an enormous amount of effort and coordination. The other thing that Neil talked about is the need to intervene early. He talked about prevent being able to identify vulnerability, to be able to safeguard against that vulnerability, to be able to disrupt um, where we can. So neighbourhood policing is seen as a, an offender management model at a very, very local level. Because we start, we're seeing that in other areas of vulnerability. So um, I'm, I'm sure you'll have examples in your areas where, for example, police community support officers might be doing follow-up visits to, say, victims of domestic violence. Well, what would their intervention look like against a residual subject of interest uh, that might not feature on national investigation priorities but may very well pose a threat locally? What could we offer in that regard? And that's a, an active dialogue that we're, that we're having at the moment as to what would the level of investment be uh, for us to do more integrated offender management at neighbourhood level to boost our prevent activity. Now, prevent has been interpreted as target in certain sections of society. Uh, and I strongly agree with Neil that it's, for me it's the one strand of the strategy that offers us most hope for the future because we can't investigate our way out of this, can we? We need to intervene earlier in order to prevent. We need to work closely, like we saw on the Troubled Families slide, with integrated partners, including with health. Now, um, if your experience is anything like mine, that's sometimes one of the most difficult um, uh, partnerships that we have, sometimes because of the patient confidentiality that comes with it. Uh, and a recent landscape review that was done with Public Health England um, talked about some of the excellent collaborative work that's ongoing and we hope that we will see a national concordat in that respect as well in a similar way that we've seen with mental health because uh, an in increasing focus has been that early intervention between uh, neighbourhood policing teams and health. Uh, some good examples for example in South Wales breaking generational cycles, some examples in Lancashire about transforming lives. So an area where I think neighbourhood policing needs to move is earlier intervention with health in particular because uh, sometimes they get the first signs of this alongside colleagues in education. And of course the challenge for us is a leadership one, isn't it? We're faced with dwindling resources, competing priorities in serious and organised crime and cyber, and let's not forget, you know, our community still suffer antisocial behaviour, the things that affect their, their daily lives. Uh, Gavin spoke this morning about the rise in some traditional crime types again. But perhaps the most important threat that we face is the one that Neil has described. And I don't think neighbourhood policing, despite the threat on resources, can turn away with that. So the Police Foundation research, and I would encourage you to have a look at it, um, talked about where neighbourhood policing has managed to thrive in certain areas of the country despite the pressure on resources. And what some colleagues have managed to do is to reshape their neighbourhood policing teams into teams with the right mix of skills the right training, the right leadership to intervene against some of these more difficult problems. So of course they make difficult choices, so they might not be spending as long dealing with a housing dispute, a local antisocial behaviour issue, but they might be very well tuned into what prevent priorities they need to do locally. 
Because local policing is about place, isn't it? It's about a community. Increasingly, that can be an online community, so it can be about space as well. And we need to make sure that we're there. We need to make, make sure that we're there providing visible reassurance. I was talking to Neil in the break that um, uh, just a day after the attacks in Barcelona, I was uh, over in, in, in Madrid for a few days and saw very much the visible policing presence that we were able to put into giving reassurance in, in crowded places. And we do that along with colleagues in Europe very well. And I've certainly felt safe walking around Madrid. But what about those day-to-day -day feelings of safety? Um, because neighbourhood policing back in 2005 talked about communities that not only are safe, but they feel safe as well. Back to the first slide, they need to have that connection and think that we're a legitimate service for them. So how can you help with this? Well, following on from the, uh, the, the HMI's uh, commentary on erosion of neighbourhood policing, the, a recommendation was given to the college um, for a guidelines committee about neighbourhood policing. We recognised that we probably hadn't updated um, what we said was good practice and research around neighbourhood policing since that heyday of 2005 to 2008 when investment was at its peak. So a guidelines committee is currently running. I'm chairing that with uh, contribution from lots of colleagues at different levels of the service from all around the country with interested academics, subject matter experts. And at the moment, there's a call for practice out. So as well as, as looking at the international evidence of what works, uh, we're asking colleagues from around the country to say, what works for you? So what is it that you've got in place in your communities today that we need to make sure that builds into the best practice of the future? Um, about half of forces around the country have responded so far. It would be really good when you finish this conference or even during conference to make uh, contact with uh, colleagues back in force and please make contributions to that research because we'll pull that together um, from across the UK and in uh, early part of next year we'll produce the first phase of new guidance uh, for neighbourhood policing teams um, which will hopefully direct us more towards some of the threats that Neil has described. So we can show that our communities that we really do care about the threats that they're facing and in return they will help us with these very real challenges uh, that Neil has, Neil has described. So conscious that we want to allow times for questions and debate, so I shall end it there. Pass back to Cathy. Thank you both very much. I found that really fascinating, a real insight into uh, what the challenges that you're encountering. Um, I've got loads of questions coming in on the app. Um, it'd be great to have some questions here in the hall as well. Um, and I thought I'd kick off, really. Um, Gavin, just to put to you a quote from the Prime Minister just before the election, she said, we've protected counter-terrorism policing budgets. We've also provided funding for an increase in the number of armed police officers and since 2015, we have protected overall police budgets. She also said that the police are crying wolf over resources. Are you? Well, um, we're certainly not crying wolf over resources, and I think Gavin's described in some of the media coverage he's done this morning about uh, the rise in nature of threat, which, you know, Neil, in just one area of policing, has given us a very graphic description of the threats that we're facing. Um, colleagues in the room will know that uh, they're making very difficult choices day in, day out as to uh, what demand we can uh, afford to service and what we can't. Uh, one of the things that's suffered most is the investment in the local, which I've described. And of course, if we're to be successful in tackling the more serious threats, we must maintain that investment in the local. So, yes, there may well have been some additional money for armed policing, but not in every area of the country. Uh, it only went to some areas. Uh, and there may well have been a, an investment in, um, in the CT network. Um, but as Neil described, 50 to 70% of the effort um, post-attack comes from local policing anyway. And if we're recruiting into uh, armed policing, they co it comes from the local resource. Uh, so there's a, there's a real need um, to make sure that we maintain the level of investment and then I would say return some of the levels of investment that we had in 2008 because that's the only thing that will allow our communities not only to be safe, but to feel safe at the same time. Well, let me bounce that on to Neil then. Is it, would you say, more important to hire extra neighbourhood police officers, more important to hire them than extra counter-terrorism officers? Well, it's never that binary a conversation, is it? But um, she was certainly saying that we were crying wolf at a time which was very different. So I went two and a half years ago when I was outside CT policing, I used to see CT as the rich uncle that sort of 
lived somewhere that I would never actually see and we were being cut, cut, cut. And there wasn't really an argument made by CT policing, which was fighting very much for its own corner. Um, and was under attack for not being effective and efficient enough, just like the rest of policing. And I had to go through a very long process since 2012 to prove that it could become more efficient and effective. So we had to deliver for the government for the 2015 spending review £200 million worth of savings, which we weren't allowed to reinvest. We had to give those back. So yes, we were given some money to keep the CC grant stable. Uh, and yes, at the moment, what we've decided to do with that CT grant money if we had not had the summer we've just had and the threats I've described would be sufficient to keep us in place. But what those threats have demonstrated is exactly what we've said, is the people who have to deal with those threats for many more days and weeks than we realised uh, is actually wider core policing. So it makes no difference that I've got sufficient detectives, I've got for, uh, sufficient forensics, I've got sufficient armed police officers to make the arrests. It doesn't actually make any difference if the rest of policing is missing. And I think the most important thing, and the reason why Gavin and I have done this as a two-part presentation, is the bit that is being under-invested in is Prevent. And Prevent starts off in communities, and all the relationships that are developed in Prevent are the same relationships that have been developed for troubled families, that have been de developed for mental health hubs. It's all the usual, anyone here who works uh, as a divisional commander or is a deputy to a borough commander will kind of understand um, or runs a command about how difficult it is to tie in to all that extra asset if you've got nothing to put on the table. So if all of that's disappeared, that is a major problem. And CT policing, just to reassure you all, is not sitting in Whitehall conversation saying, we're fine. Mm -hmm. Particularly after what's happened this summer, we're saying policing is not fine. And I'm sure you'll be putting some of those points to the Minister in the next um, presentation. Um, you mentioned Prevent. Uh, there's a couple of questions coming on the app on Prevent. Uh, one, with significant adverse publicity in relation to Prevent and its credibility within our communities, what is the future for this approach and how can we reassure the community so they support this ethos? Feedback suggested is viewed with mistrust. Are you planning to change this? Let's put that to you. Yeah, and I think we're doing quite a lot to change that. So you'll have seen Simon Cole, who's regularly out, uh, absolutely challenging that view, and has had quite a lot of bilaterals behind the scenes to change some of the political views that have been harnessed by some very vocal but very small sections of the community that have their reasons for undermining Prevent. Um, Gavin, do you think it's time for a rebrand at the very least? Well, I think, it's, it I think it's time for us to continue to make the case strongly like Simon and colleagues have been doing. Um, what we found from the uh, research for the, from the national programme was that actually the best advocates of this, if you can turn them around, are community members themselves. So when you get successful cases and people begin to advocate that, when it's not the police having to advocate, that it's partners advocating, when it's community members advocating, then we will know that we've turned the corner. Um, but that, that's going to take a considerable amount of leadership effort. But you both think still carry on calling it prevent, just make the case better. Well, I, I think that, that argument's been made many times and just changing the name of something but yeah. continuing to do the same thing um, is always a mistake. Would that, it be an be acknowledgement spotted. that it's been controversial? No, I think it's been controversial for a number of years, but I think it's been controversial because we've not been transparent enough in describing what it is, who it targets, so it's all violent ideology. So that includes extreme right wing, yeah. of which there's a quite a high percentage of referral into channel are actually right wing extremists They're not, and white supremacists. It's not the um, uh, radicals sort of Islamist terrorist. So we've not been transparent enough. So you asked me what we, we should be doing, and Simon is making real sort of inroads in trying to do this. The Home Office have agreed that we need to be more transparent with the data. I think we need to get that message out there more and more and stop wasting a lot of time and effort on a communication strategy which is going to describe exactly the same tactics. Because once people understand what the tactics are, and it is about safeguarding early intervention and vulnerability, and then see some of the live case examples where it's really worked, um, you can change hearts and minds with that, but we need to say it out loud more often. Gavin, I mean, renaming it, are you also of the view that that wouldn't really make any difference? No, and I, you know, it says what it does on the tin. It's trying to prevent, you know, um, uh, people getting into violent extremism. But it's so, become a dirty word in the community. It, well, it, it, only in some sections, you know, and, and this is where I think the sort of leadership responsibility for all of us is, is to be more vocally positive about it. Um, I think it is possible to turn the corner on it.
Right, time to have some questions from the hall. So there are roving mics. If you could stick your hand up, give us a wave, and uh, grab one of the mics and say who you are and where you're from, even if you're really important, because everyone in the room is important. And I can't see a single hand going up. I mean, I've got bags more questions, but this is your conference. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you. I'm Jim Allen. I'm a BCU commander for Derby in Derbyshire. Uh, myself and my counterpart in the local authority are busily engaged in hostile vehicle mitigation measures. Is that the right use of our energy and our money? Neil. If Lucy was sitting here, she'd certainly say yes. If we look at some of the... I talked about the way the methodology and the targeting has changed. We know, you know, so-called IS for probably... I think probably about 18 months to two years, they've had that as a methodology that they've been propounding on the internet. Um, it is a really serious issue. If we've got um, crowded places that are vulnerable to that kind of attack, we've got to do something about it. I've seen some of the costs involved from the national work that's been done from forces like yourself, uh, and the cost is eye-watering. There is no doubt about it. So I think there are going to be some very clinical choices that have to be made about the balance of risk uh, against the security. All I can say, and I do say to the government and you know, my counterparts in MI5 say, is the threat's very real, it exists, and you've seen concrete, fatal evidence of it. Yeah. And it, I think it, it's, it's one for uh, planners for years to come, I think. And interestingly, going back to the, the Madrid experience about uh, crowded places, so yes, they were doing some of the sort of hostile mitigation that we would recognise, say, on Westminster Bridge. Uh, but equally, they, they already, within days, they were starting to do... Um, you know, large concrete planters with, you know, trees in and things like that that would block off access to big public plazas. So I think we've got to get our heads around, town planners have got to get our heads around, you know, we need to design safe public spaces in future to counter this threat. And private sector investment is where, if you think about all the work we've done with people like the Premier League around policing, core policing, there does need to be a bit of a user pays principle here. If we want safe public spaces that aren't going to look like they're places you would never want to go out because yeah. they make you feel unsafe. The only people who can deliver that kind of level of investment is actually the private sector, the businesses who want you know, the economy to flourish in those areas, the large shopping centres and their car parts and their, kind of, uh, and their footfall from public transport. Trying to convince them that security pays is really difficult. I don't know many security directors who sit on the boards of companies. I know quite a lot of them because they tend to be ex-us. <laughs> Um, but very few of them have actually got a seat on the board. So they are fighting boards whose bottom line is profit. And they don't actually see this is a very, this is a short-term loss for them. They don't see, until there's a disaster, they don't really see it. There has definitely been some very encouraging uh, conversations that Lucy Dorsey has had. But what a shame they've had to come at the expense of people's lives. Another one for you, Neil, from the app. Um, how confident are you that operational superintendents and chief superintendents know what their role and responsibility is in the event of a terrorist incident, particularly in the early stages of an incident? Um, in some parts of the country, massively confident. And I think you've only got to look at the results in... So Manchester was our first massive attack for many, many years, other than Northern Ireland many years ago, outside of London. And the response... Um, the response was very impressive. Um, it isn't... HMIC have just done... I think it's been published. They've just done a report into how well prepared we are uh, in the early stages, and there are definitely some gaps. So I mentioned it in, the, in my opening. There are some gaps. Uh, and I don't blame forces, because actually the training, exercising, investment that goes into... You know, it's your force control room staff are probably some of the most important people, because it's literally in those first few minutes that really counts. It's like the old golden hour principles we remember from critical incident training. If we don't have our youngest junior members of staff understanding instinctively what to do there and then, we've got a bit of a problem. We need to keep exercising and testing them to do that. In parts of the country where they've managed that very effectively, um, luckily for us, two of those were London and GMP. Uh, you know, the, I'm not sure that would necessarily be the same everywhere else, and it is worth... Uh, if you're interested in this subject, may sort of contact with your sort of uh, protect and prepare leads and say how much work has been done in that area. And I think you'll be surprised. So if Lucy was sitting here, she'd say she has eight, eight individuals across the country who are responsible for all 43 forces for delivering that. And that can't be right. So it's one of the areas where we want to put more investment in so that we can test and train. Um, but I, I, I wouldn't... There is something about policing and our can-do attitude that makes it do Even when people don't think they know what to do, their instincts really count. So I would never denigrate anybody. And half the problem with exercise and testing is people feel they're on an exam 
So, and if they fail during the exercise and testing, it can break them. And we're, uh, we don't need people feeling that way. So the exercising and testing regimes need to be learning exercises. I know it sounds a bit management cliche, but they're not there to break people. We all make mistakes. I mean, I've, every single one of these attacks, I've done something slightly different because I've learned from every single one of them. You know, and we have a different, and we're going through all of those reviews with government and MI5 at the moment, and we're learning a lot from that. And so, and that's quite right. That's as it should be. So I don't want to blame anyone. That yeah, I was going to say, can you name the areas you're most worried about? But, no. Uh, um, Gavin, are you confident that in your own patch in Surrey that your, if there was, God forbid, to be an, a terrorist attack, that you would be ready and ready to go? Well, I think, as, as Neil said, we're, we're well rehearsed at dealing with critical incidents of, uh, of many natures. I mean, uh, Steve here from, from Sussex and not so long back in Sussex, they had the terrible Shoreham air crash. So we're... Where you get large-scale public disaster, actually, the police service and its partners are pretty good at uh, rallying round. And what um, Neil and colleagues do through the national network is very, give very quick guidance as well. So, yes, there's no substitute for testing and exercising. We do that regularly now, for example, with uh, uh, a marauding terrorist firearms attack. So um, officers are, are well drilled in what to do. Um, but, of course, the response can go on for many days and weeks, can't it? So, um, and it, you know, coming back to one of the points about neighbourhood policing, when it's there and it's thriving, it means that communities can recover more quickly as well from whatever the catastrophic event is that they've failed. So as well as uh, testing and exercising the immediate aftermath of it, we need to think through what our plans are for week one, month one, month two. And sometimes I think we could do more on that. Could I just make a point that I was making about those four attacks absorbing that amount of detective asset? They obviously, that was a small fraction of it, the detective asset. So um, as I've got the platform and you, there's a whole room of superintendents from all over the country here, one of the things we do experience, and I experienced it as much with London as I did with Manchester, is local pride. There's a bit of local pride about we can deal with this. Um, let me tell you, you can't. That is the experience. But what you have got is access to me and I've got access to 8,000 people who will come and help you that you wouldn't ordinarily have access to. So if you're sitting in a force and you have an incident and you think, now, what's quite interesting is one of the, the drop-down menu, if it's a Plato or an MTFA, that's easy to follow and that's well drilled and it's on your force control room systems. And one of those phone calls your force control room is supposed to make is to me. Uh, and one of the others is to special forces. And quite interestingly, on a couple of occasions, that hasn't happened. So I do, I'm going to find out about it pretty quickly, don't you worry. But nevertheless, I'd rather hear about it from you. And the first thing we do is stand up the network to help you. Now, it might take a couple of hours to do, but within a couple of hours, you've got lots of other resources being mobilised to assist you. So um, it, that is worth checking with your protect and prepare leads, whether that people understand that that system is in place to help. Because I think Gavin's right, the Jessup stuff, all the major critical incident, major... Um, that's been developed for years and I think it's pretty good. You'll all have a cadre of people who are well trained and well rehearsed in all those strategic coordination groups. If it's a terrorist incident, it doesn't quite fit a Plato. People start, this is the trouble with teaching people in tick boxes. It doesn't quite work, but you kind of know it when it happens and you'll feel it. And that sounds like a really simple thing to say. But we've had stuff where we have had to debate, do we call this a terrorist attack or not? We don't know yet but we should be treating as it is internally in the police until we know differently. And I was interested in what you were saying, calling the Buckingham Palace incident a plot, a disruptive plot, and hadn't heard it described that way. But uh, I didn't call it a plot. You said a disruptive plot. It's a disruption. It's a police disruption. If I okay. called it a plot, that's probably a mistake, but it is clearly sub <laughs> okay. So let's or just maybe not tweet that way. <laughs> um, let's have another question before we get into hot water here. Just here, please. The microphone is coming your way. There you go. Hi, um, I'm Sue Williams, I'm the Borough Commander at Tower Hamlets in the Met Police and last week I had um, the pleasure of the Home Secretary coming down on one of her tours around Prevent to talk to the partners and look at some of the initiatives in the community. Um, one of the things that wasn't high on her agenda was investing in community cohesion and for those of us that were involved in 2005 London bombing and the aftermath of that, we put a lot of investment into community cohesion, which was probably right for the time, um, but the Home Office has moved away from that going forward. Is that something you think we should be encouraging them to invest in in the future so the police can work with um, projects to, in, 
to get into communities to build up that cohesion so that we get that community intelligence and we know what's going on? Um, yeah. I'll kick it off, no doubt, Neil. Get over here. So yeah, yes is the short answer. Because any, anywhere that we get communities that somehow feel alienated from, other, from their neighbours or alienated from the police service, we know we get problems. So without that legitimate relationship with police service, the rest of policing becomes so much more difficult. Um, and it, if you go back to the reports on the, uh, the riots in, in, in the 90s, that talked about communities that lead parallel lives, so communities that are on each other's doorsteps but are not interacting at all. And that that's, poses big risks. So yes is a short answer. And you can't win the trust without looking more like the community you represent. Absolutely. Neil. Yeah, I mean, I, absolutely yes. Um, and uh, it would be an interesting one to ask the police minister. So those of you who remember where I said I'm from will know that Sue and I do know each other very well and specifically was not supposed to ask a question that would get me into political trouble. <laughs> um, but I think there is a problem in government between there is a, a mismatch at the moment between a counter-extremism policy and a community cohesion policy. Now, I'm a massive Lucy, uh, Louise Casey fan. Anyone who's read any of her work will understand that this is... The reason Gavin and I have done this particular presentation is it's all about this, I think. The future is all about this. Uh, Cameron was right when he described it as a generational challenge. You know, everyone who succeeds from everyone sitting in this room will be dealing with this. Uh, and unless we get this bit right, we're in terrible trouble, I think. So the government needs another Louise Casey, or better still, to they, get it back? They, they need to look at the recommendations that were made. They need to understand what's happening to neighbourhood policing. They need to relook at Prevent, and they need to put it all together. Because all the great tools and effort that's used in Prevent uh, have all been, you know, they've been long developed in other areas of policing, you know, and the troubled families work and all the rest of it. There's lots of synergy and similarities and similar people and similar NGOs who are capable of doing this kind of work. At the moment, it seems to be in two completely different pots. Another question just here. Thank you. Dave Sturman, Head of Operations at West Midlands. I'd be interested in your view around powers available to us as a service, given the worrying escalation in numbers of subjects of interest. Are you satisfied uh, that we've got sufficient powers available to us at the moment? I'm thinking specifically around uh, TPIMS uh, and where they might go in the future. Given the scale of the threat, given the delicate balance that is always trod between human rights, civil liberties and protecting people, and um, if we've got enough tools in the box, really, to, to effectively neutralise this escalating threat. Um, I was quite interested in somebody's idea about an ASBO for terrorism. I was fairly sceptical about that when I first heard it, but that might be me being a bit partial for locking people away for life as the best form of prevent, so, which, I, which I, don't, I don't think is a sustainable strategy. So we've, we've got a lot of people at the lower end of offending who I'd rather never got that far. So having some kind of lower level controls about people which we can then get them into some programs which might change their mind. Even if we change one or two minds that way, can you imagine those one or two people if they go on and commit an atrocity like we've had and the, the human and economic cost of that? It would be well worth the investment. So I would like to see that lower level piece. Um, in terms of new legislation, I'm kind of with Max Hill. There isn't very much that we don't have. T PIMS is but more. But are you using it properly? Yeah, that's a that is a very good question. So there and are. The answer is. Not 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 entirely no, not entirely no. I take that on the chin, and we have done with government. So we've just asked government for there has been a legislation review as part of the post tax review. Uh, we have asked for changes in. We've contributed to the changes, both ourselves, the Crown Prosecution Service, um, Max Hill's seen the work. Um, the government have worked extensively on it, and there are probably 14 areas. I won't go through them all, you'll be pleased to know. But a couple of them, for instance, we don't use lower level offending because we know that the sentences that are given for that lower level offending are so small that effectively we'll have this revolving door problem. They'll get, no, they'll get nothing inside that will actually change their mind, and they'll be out, back out on the street with a longer risk problem. So we in covert uh, policing are trying to make sure that we get them for a much more substantive offence. If the sentence that was available for that crime was actually given out, so we've asked for sentencing guidelines to be looked at and tougher sentencing around that, then we might be able to use those offences more often. And those offences, without going into all the detail in an open forum, those offences are easier to prove. The reason we don't use them as much is because they don't lead to anything. If they don't lead to anything, it's not mitigating the risk. Gavin, do you have the tools or do you just need to use the ones you've got? So I'm interested, like Neil is in the debate, about what 
we might be able to do it in earlier interventions. So we have had a dialogue this summer about, so say, for example, domestic violence prevention notices and orders, what might be the equivalent of that in the CT world? So it may be that we can be creative with the current legislation that we've got around, you know, for antisocial behaviour legislation, for example. But I think there is something in... If, we, if, the, if the, the nature of the threat has changed for the long term, as Neil has described it, from, you know, people that are, you know, maybe not high up on the radar that they're out there in our communities, then we need to get much more tuned into early disruption of those. Uh, and we might need some tools to do that early disruption. And the, the domestic violence one, I think, is interesting because it gives us some immediate control, doesn't it, at, at superintending level, and very quickly we can get it before a court for additional scrutiny if we need to. So I'd, I'd welcome an examination in that area. One thing I'd really like is, um, I think Lucy would say the same thing, is some, I was Daxo before Lucy, so... Some of the protect and prepare stuff that I described, trying to get the private sector interested, needs to be a carrot and stick approach. And part of that is you're going to get a license for an event if you, all your stewards are, you know, trained in, have all the Griffin training or the Argus training. But also you might get a discount on your insurance premiums or whatever. You know, I don't, I don't care what it is, but there needs, we need to pull the private sector into a, a space where they understand it's partly their responsibility. So any, any kind of change in legislation around that, I would have seen as good. I'm not sure we're going to get there yet, but that's still. A dialogue that's ongoing. Another question from the app. Uh, we still hear chief officers saying that neighbourhood policing is an important foundation in counter-terrorism, notably in the media following attacks. How does this sit alongside forces reducing the size and footprint of their commitment to local engagement when faced with the need to bolster other response, investigative and specialist teams? Is it just reassuring rhetoric? Yeah, Neil. <laughs> Thanks. I was hoping that was coming to you first. It's not, I don't blame a single chief constable that is prioritising their resources on threat. Um, the threat we're describing is such a long-term investment that if you're not answering 999 calls and you're not dealing with the serious crimes that have been reported today, then you're going to be a very short-lived chief constable. And if the only resources you've got available, once they're stretched over those priorities, leave you with nothing left for neighbourhood policing, that is a problem. The only reason neighbourhood policing started to get really established, and I was one of those very lucky borough commanders in uh, 2009 that had all the investment and I had the biggest safer neighbourhood cadre in London, and I understand exactly what that can deliver for you, and that was excellent. That was all additional growth on top of those resources. Austerity, and I am not for one second saying that policing didn't need to make, play its part in austerity. So whatever we think, we spent years squandering a lot of money, like a lot of other public sector. And we had to become more effective, we had to become more efficient. I just think we've gone way too far. Yeah. yeah. I guess, I guess don't, don't confuse advocacy for rhetoric. because we, So we need to continue to advocate that we need to reinvest in this area. So, and we, we ought to say that loudly, as Gavin has done this morning, and continue to do so. At the same time, you and Chief Officer colleagues around the country, of course, face some very difficult choices about where we spend our money. I guess one thing that the Police Foundation research shows is that some colleagues have chosen to um, use neighbourhood policing teams and continue to invest in neighbourhood policing teams, but train them to deal with the new threat. So whilst we're under pressure, I think that offers us some avenue of hope if you look at that research, but absolutely we need some reinvestment. Very quick, one final question from the floor. Anyone have a further question here? Um, and you've already got the mic. I so have, yeah, so one of the benefits. Uh, Matthew Nichols from Hertfordshire. Given the attack methodologies that were shown um, up on the screen, and we all know um, recent attack methodology is involving either vehicles or um, uh, bladed weapons, isn't it time that we provided every officer with a sidearm for their own protection um, and to provide initial protection to the public. Gavin. Uh, no. Um, and it, I'll take you back to the quote in the, uh, the US report for 21st century policing, where it talked about being seen in a, a guardian role, not an occupying force. So one of the things that I hold really dear to my heart about UK policing is that we police by consent, that we earn the trust and legitimacy of our communities, uh, and I think it would be a marked change for us if we were to become a fully armed force in that way. I think it would fundament, fundamentally alter the nature, nature of the relationship between the police service and the communities that we serve. Um, so Even after the death of PC Palmer, did that give you pause for thought? Yeah, of course. All, all of the serious attacks give us, give us pause for thought. But I think we need to think about the whole system. And I guess at our peril that we move away from something that we've valued since 1829.
Neil. Um, I agree with the consent point entirely. A model where we're all armed is not a consensual model. It's policing by coercion. Uh, I'm sure everybody in this room travels widely on holiday. I always think it's quite instructive, even as a very experienced senior officer. I find police officers who are fully tooled up on every street corner a very intimidating sight. You should probably ask members of the public what they really feel because there is some studies that show this, that when we put more protective security out post a terrorist attack or where we've arrested people in terrorism, there is a shelf life for how well, how safe the public feel mm. by seeing that armed presence on the street. So that's the first point. The second point is I'd be realistic. So I'm an ex-head of armed policing. No one has more respect for armed police officers than me. Uh, 19, if they were sitting in this room, would tell you that. There's a couple of people from armed OCUs in, uh, in London, I hope, would respect that. The reason I respect them so much is they are easily the most professional people I've ever had to manage in my entire career, and because they are highly focused, highly trained, and doing the same thing day in, day out. I remember seeing one line about, I think it was at the last Chief Constable's Council, about if we were going to train everyone, um, it would probably mean a minimum of two weeks handling on a sidearm, uh, and that's what we'd have to do to train every officer in the UK. So forget about cost, that's the time. Uh, and if you think you're capable of tackling terrorists when you've been trained for two weeks on a Glock, go and fire one. Good note on which to end. Um, I thought it was a really high caliber first session to the conference. I found it really fascinating. Thank you to both of our speakers. That was great. And thank you for all those fantastic questions.